we have, at long last, come to the launch of the Nintendo 64 with our first couple of N64 titles with Nintendo Power number 88 for September 1996. Our cover game for this issue is, appropriately enough, Super Mario 64. In the letters column, we have an appropriately timed letter complaining about too much N64 coverage because when the letter was written, the console wasn't out yet. So, well, <laughs> it's out now, so you can expect even more N64 coverage. In fact, you can expect going forward le less Super Nintendo coverage. And, and eventually, absolutely no Virtual Boy coverage. <laughs> on the power charts, we have a whole bunch of returning RPGs on the Super Nintendo and a trio of new titles for the Game Boy. Now we have an article on the N64 launch because, as I've said a couple times before, it's out, and so we got some coverage of it. Toys R Us locations across the U.S. will have demo kiosks. The article is saying that they will have three, but I will admit at the store that my mom was at at the time, which was be in the middle of a significant remodel and an overall stylistic refresh and reset, they only had the one. And after the launch, I think they just narrowed down the number of kiosks to one there as well. Also... It was going to be, again, our model during the N64 launch, which was also, it bears mentioning, contemporaneous with the release of Tickle Me Elmo. So if you were working toy store retail at this time, your life was hell. Of note, the article points out that the N64 was not shipped with an AV cable with the explicit assumption, as spelled out in the article, that you would just use your Super Nintendo's AV cord, which... I mean, certainly they're going to have a significant amount of your audience who are going to buy your console who have um, the Super Nintendo already. It was a very well high-selling console. But considering the N64 library hadn't quite gotten up there yet, and again, just like with the Super Nintendo to the Super, to the Super NES, N64 ain't backwards compatible, that seems presumptuous. I I am interested to find out, or would be interested to find out, if later releases of the N64 came with the AV cable. We Here we are, at last, our first N64 review, with Super Mario 64, the flagship game for the system. We have notes on the hub world for the castle, and how many stars are needed to unlock the various worlds. From there, we get Mario's move list and information on how to get the stars for Bomb on Battlefield, Womp's Fortress, and the Princess's Hidden Slide. Super Mario 64 is, in essence, the roots of a variety of 3D platformer that we're going to see a lot of over the next few years of gaming. Not just on the N64, but on the PlayStation as well. While we're still going to see platformers with the sort of linear level-based structure we've seen in the past on the 8-bit and 16-bit consoles with games on the 32-bit consoles like Crash Bandicoot and Blasto and later Jack and Daxter, Mario 64 changes up the fundamental structure of the game. Oddly enough, it does it by adapting the structure of a game that previously panned, the freeform Amiga-based, Amiga-inspired platformer, or originally developed for Amiga platformer, with a structure like U.S. Gold's Adam's Family games. In that game, you have a hub area, and then a bunch of additional levels coming out of it where the player is put in a position to collect various items to unlock subsequent levels and boss fights. In this case, it's the castle, is your hub, and then you are collecting stars in your subsequent worlds, which will in turn unlock further up levels and ultimately boss fights against Bowser. What makes Mario 64 work in ways that those Amiga-inspired games or Amiga-developed games didn't is it provides the player with a clear sense of direction. You know, up front, what you need to get. You have to get stars in order to unlock new levels and unlock boss fights against Bowser. Accumulating them unlocks more areas of the game, more and more fights with Bowser. And consequently, when you enter the spoke levels, that is, the levels off of the hub where you're going to collect those stars, when you enter, you get a clue as to what you need to do to get the next star, even if you didn't talk to any of the toads in the castle, thus giving you a sense of direction. Oh, I need to 
get to the top and fight King Bamon. I have to race this Koopa to the top of the uh, spire, that sort of thing. Additionally, after the initial star at a level has been obtained, most of the other stars can be collected in almost any order. This gives the player a sense of freedom to explore and experiment, like you'd get in those Amiga platformers, but again without a sense of feeling lost, since if you've exhausted your just general exploration options without pursuing the, cl the clue to the next star, that clue's still there. You can still take that route if you feel so inclined. Further, by using this structure, because you're having the player revisit existing areas that they've gone to before in those spokes, it actually creates an economy of labor on the development side. Because instead of having to create, for instance, 72 distinct levels like in Super Mario World, or 90 distinct levels like in Super Mario Bros. 3, you have just 15 levels, but with a variety of challenges to accomplish within them to obtain enough stars to finish off Bowser and free Princess Peach. Now we're going to see a lot more of this structure going forward to various extents, like, like in particular, rare platformers like Donkey Kong, Six, Donkey Kong 64 and Banjo-Kazooie, which means I'll be talking those, about those in the future. And again, if you're, on the, if you're more on the PlayStation side of things, you'll see this employed as well in, for example, Spyro the Dragon. Continuing with our N64 games, our second one we'll, re we'll be reviewing this issue is Pilot Wing 64. We have profiles of the six playable pilots and tips and maps for the A and B license challenges for hang glider, rocket belt, and gyrocopter. The problem with Pilot Wing 64 is that, frankly, the analog stick isn't really where the game needs to be in terms of controls. On more than a few occasions, I found myself really having to crank on the stick to try and handle some maneuvers, and even then, I really wasn't able to quite line up what I was trying to do to my satisfaction. I understand what I get they're going to do here, or trying to do, but this is meant to get you accustomed to using an analog stick in a non-arcade stick fashion. The problem is the stick on the controller doesn't quite get it for what they're trying to do. I wonder if a remake, not a the later Pilot Wings game, but if a remake of this one, uh, done for a more modern controller, sort of like with what ends with the um, remakes of the, or re-releases of the, for example, GameCube uh, Mario Sunshine games, would fare better than this one did on the N64 controller and with that analog stick. The last of the N64 games I'll be reviewing this issue will be Cruise in USA, which, while the article's more in the realm of preview coverage, and where it gets into more into the initially playable cars and some general gameplay notes, along with discussion of graphics, but on the other hand, like, outside of level maps, there's not too much that they could do go in depth here, so let's give it a, a let's give it our thoughts. On the one hand, I do appreciate that Cruise in USA has the controls configured to be effectively ambidextrous. The A and B buttons are not gameplay critical. They handle changing the music station and the camera perspective with the actual gameplay essential stuff. Gear shift and, and um, braking is handled by, respectively, the C buttons and D-pad and shoulder buttons, with the Z-trigger serving as an accelerator and steering being done on the analog stick. And that makes this a very a a solid and effective arcade port. Like, my complaint with the game is the way the traffic spawns are handled by RNG. If it weren't for the fact that the snowballing car crash physics can sometimes work in your favor, in terms of recovering the lead or whether you take the lead, I'd honestly play without oncoming traffic at all. The last of our big N64 articles this issue is a more just general preview for Turok Dinosaur Hunter, which gets at the game's premise, the graphics, and that there are a lot of guns. This is lighter enough that I'm going to hold off on reviewing this game until we get to something more specific, possibly with level maps and that sort of thing. In the classified information column, we have a bunch of combat codes for the Super Nintendo version of Mortal Kombat 3. 
Now, we still have some Super Nintendo games left, as we have a feature article from on Realm from Titus, which appears to take some inspiration from Turrican, or, for that matter, various similar Amiga and PC run-and-gun games, which many of themselves have also taken inspiration from Turrican. We have maps for most of the game, along with notes for those levels. Realm is a pretty good workmanlike run-and-gun game with some decent weapon design that checks all the contra boxes, um, but with some poor choices in terms of monster design. Um, and I don't mean like the nitty-gritty of the graphical side of things, but in terms of how it fits in the gameplay environment. For example, in the game's first area, the level design has flames at various points of the level that, from a general visual design standpoint, would be keeping with torches or light sources. You can touch them, and you won't take any significant damage that would take you out of action. Except what they actually are, <clears throat> is they are endless spawn points for flame enemies that will come after you and will continue to spawn enemies even when they're just off screen. Then, on top of that, you can't even destroy the enemy spawn points, not even temporarily. That plus the pure density of on-screen enemies and the lack of mid-level checkpointing makes the game much more frustrating than it really needs to be. Our Kirby Superstar Guide continues with maps for several more areas of the game. I, I previously reviewed this one uh, just a couple episodes back, so check that episode out. In Epic Center News, Luffy at 2 is finally coming out, and the Japanese port of SimCity 2000 might get a U.S. release. Well, kind of, sort of, not really. It does get a... We do get a... Well, there is a, I should say, um, N64 version of um, SimCity 2000 made, but that is for the DD, and that doesn't come out here. And as far as the Super Nintendo port of it, um, well, it does come out, but there are some significant losses to it. And perhaps worst of all, um, there is no mouse support when the mouse was out at this time and the, and like the N64 or N64, but the, um, PC version of it took advantage of the mouse much more significantly in terms of click and dragging in level environments to size your um, city blocks for zoning as opposed to just having set 3x3 three three block grids as with the first game. In any case, um, we have a sequel to War 2030, 2095 already, which is Really quick turnaround, with some information on general gameplay notes. War 3010 is, like its predecessor, a competent, though flawed, tactical RPG. The strategic layer is fine, though it does have the situation similar to Military Madness games, where you're starting with the same unit selection on each mission each time, with no real incentive to preserve your forces. As long as you got one ship at the end of the mission, you win. Now, yeah, this is to a certain degree a thing for playing miniatures war games, but the advantage of miniatures war game is you are putting together and painting and customizing your units and bringing them out in front of people. You know, the whole my Warhammer army is painted with the Hello Kitty color scheme kind of thing. Um, and that's not the case here. You can't even customize your unit appearance. On top of that, because the premise of the game is based around a insurrection against alien invaders who have conquered all these human colonies, um, having some incentive to keep your forces alive would greatly help the replay value and would play into that narrative concept. We have a preview of Donkey Kong Country 3 for the Super Nintendo, which showcases Dixie as the lead and a new character as a supporting character that is not Donkey nor Diddy Kong. The Super Nintendo is getting a, preview, a, a sequel to Prince of Persia. We have a preview with notes on the story and a few notes on gameplay changes, but not much more than that. Our third of the Super Nintendo previews is for Maui Mallard, a platformer with Donald Duck assuming a Magnum P.I. inspired persona. Sans the mustache. In Counselor's Corner, we have a bunch of tips for Super Mario RPG and Uncharted Waters. 
Well, a bunch, a whole bunch of uh, Game Boy games are getting re-released, and we have information of what games are getting brought out. We also have an expanded guide for Donkey Kong Land 2 after the preview from last issue, which I already caused, led, led me to doing a review of the game. So, um, yeah. On the full guide front, we also get a guide for Pinocchio based on the Disney film, which I believe was getting brought out of the vault around this time, if not for a theatrical release then for home video. Disney's Pinocchio on the Game Boy, I know there's a Super Nintendo and Genesis version, or at least a Genesis version, is a unfortunately mediocre cinematic platformer. To the game's credit, the animation is incredibly fluid, especially considering the sprite size, and also everything in the game is scaled considerably well in terms of sprite size on screen, uh, environments, size of platformers, all that fun stuff. It's just that, well, the game's controls are a little rough, and it's tricky at times to tell on what on-screen sprites are obstacles and what ones are threats. Like, for example, I'm not sure if I'm taking damage from these seagulls in the level environments or not. And on top of that, when Pinocchio gets a counter-attack, and then the, in the sort of survival level subsequent to this, when playing as uh, Jimmy Cricket, it doesn't disable enemies, it just temporarily stuns them for about a second, which isn't actually helpful since the enemy just ends up becoming a threat again almost immediately. Now, I understand why, narratively, Pinocchio doesn't have, quote, attacks, but if you'd like to have nice to have some middle ground between mascot platformer combat with jumping on enemies and all that sort of thing that can cause them to fly off the map, to character is utterly combat ineffective. Now, in the Now Playing column, our also rans this issue is the Game Boy version of Tetris Attack. And finally, in the Pack Watch column, we have some Super Nintendo titles of note. Well, one, N one N64 title with Shadow of the Empire, and then the probably super high-profile Super Nintendo titles of note with Street Fighter Alpha 2 and Mortal Kombat Trilogy. My pick of the issue is, straight up, Super Mario 64. It is a very solid game, and it helped shape the form of the 3D platformer for a very good reason. I will say, being that this is the first Nintendo Power Retrospectives episode that has come out since the revelation of a lot of games, retro game grading and that sort of thing, and considering the impact that graded games have had on the used game market, Super Mario 64 is a fairly common game. Um, and for a loose copy of it, I think it goes for like, look at the price of this currently going for, I wouldn't recommend paying more than 20 bucks, US, 25 at most. Um, other than, otherwise, if you're like, if the used game stores in your area are really gouging you, you may still be able to get like a better price on a copy of Cruising You Day instead. And that one also is absolutely worth picking. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. I also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any f future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.